Perhaps the biggest question of this year's midterm elections is, why do Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's eyes look like the headlights of a runaway train that's about to derail and plow into everything that is good about America specifically and human life in general? Maybe that's just my biggest question. But in any case, the answer is simple. The woman is nuts. Proof comes in the new fundraising email from the Google-eyed socialist loon, which begins with the words, quote, and these are all real quotes, six days from now, we can defeat the brutal white supremacist forces of anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant nativism, and racism, unquote. So apparently come Tuesday, Ocasio-Cortez is planning to invade 1940s Germany. The email continues, quote, we can hold accountable the cold-hearted monsters who have repeatedly attacked our health care. We can send a message to the bigots and billionaires that this country belongs to all of us, unquote. This portion is obviously tailored to appeal to Ocasio-Cortez's base, namely shrieking hysterics who have no idea what the hell is going on outside of their own insufficiently medicated imaginations. But wait, there's more. She says this election, quote, affords us the chance to forge a powerful bulwark against Donald Trump's toxic, self-serving and destructive agenda. We must offer a path out of the darkness, unquote. This, of course, is utter nonsense since she's campaigning in Queens, where, as everyone knows, there is no path out of the darkness. Although the E-train will get you to Rockefeller Center, which is very nice around the holidays. Finally, the crazy lady concludes, quote, this is our chance to push back against white supremacist forces across our nation, against the xenophobes who are militarizing the border, against the bigots who seek to erase our transgender families, against the apologists for sexual assault and the Islamophobes who so hate to divide us, unquote. Ocasio-Cortez received an immediate response from America's white supremacist, xenophobe, militarist, bigot, apologist, Islamophobe, who issued this statement saying, quote, leave me alone, I'm busy watching porn. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hooray. All right, we're back once again broadcasting from Bin Laden's cave. And the, and the American Satan had best beware or we will... I probably shouldn't make that joke. The FBI will come charging in here. <laughs> All right. Don't miss the next chapter of Another Kingdom performed by Michael Knowles. The Clavenless Weekend has come. Last Clavenless Weekend was a bear. This one you can hold off. Today, we'll be live streaming the first 15 minutes of episode five entitled The Nightmare Feast. Head over to dailywire.com and subscribe to watch the full episode and get early access to upcoming episodes every Monday. But you can also listen to the entire episode uh, if you want, starting today, right? Can we, we can hear the entire thing starting today. Yep. And, uh, you know, get it on uh, iTunes if you want or get it uh, from SoundCloud. Make sure to subscribe to the Another Kingdom podcast and leave a good review for it because that really helps us a lot. Uh, what else do I want to tell you before we start? You know, we're going to be talking, you know that Ocasio-Cortez thing I was just talking about? It turns out that Ocasio-Cortez's support comes mostly from rich white people in Queens. I'll get back to that in just a minute. First, let's talk about a Blue Apron before we talk about rich white people. Blue Apron delivers farm fresh ingredients and step-by-step -step recipes to your door. A very cool restaurant-level food delivered to your door in packages, pre-measured with a big card that explains how to do it so you can get right to work in the kitchen watching your wife make these wonderful meals. They are really terrific meals. Uh, you get dinner in as little as 20 minutes, quick Easy recipe options with insanely delicious flavors. Blue Apron offers a range of recipes, each of them bursting with flavor. The chef designed recipes, restaurant quality meals. Give you a couple examples. Smoky chicken and sweet potato bake, right? You were thinking of planning and making that on your own. No, you weren't, you liar. Beef and broccoli in cumin spiced sauce, home style beef medallion and Michael maple pan sauce. Go in their uh, site, look at these uh, meals. You will want them. Check out this week's menu. Get your first three meals free, which is fairly inexpensive at blueapron.com slash Andrew. That's blueapron.com slash Andrew to get your first three meals free. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. So 
the election. It's basically here. Here we are. Uh, it's Tuesday. I hope you'll all go out and vote and not just sit around and complain. And, uh, you know, I should tell you, this is the most important election of our lifetime. We always, everybody always says that about every election. This is, this is the most, nobody ever says, you know, this one, eh, yeah, I, maybe, I don't know, you know, but go if you want, don't vote. No, this is the most important. And this is, you know, I have been asking around. I have some sources with like inside knowledge and I have to tell you, no one knows anything. The polls are notoriously unreliable. They have been bouncing around like crazy. Even in the Senate races, which are usually the better polls in the Cong congressional races, I don't even know who's running polls in congressional races. I don't think they matter at all. And of course, uh, turnout is everything. And nobody and everybody's telling me they don't know what's happened. So you get three possible outcomes, right? One is the Republicans win. They hold the House and they hold the Senate. That would be an amazing development, an amazing development. First of all, it would be such a slap in the face of the far left. It would be such a slap in the face. But when I say the far left, what I'm talking about is CNN, NBC, ABC, the New York Times. It would be telling them your resistance stank. What you did to Kavanaugh stank. You and your uh, hectoring people in restaurants stank. It's all of it. We'd reject all of it. It would be America just turning to them like that wonderful, uh, you know, freedom, uh, you know, system that we have that just kind of speaks back when people overstep. The left has become radical, it has become radical, and it has become socialist, and it has become violent, and it has, has become entitled, you know, it's demanding things. If we hold the House, which would just be, you know, it wouldn't be unprecedented, but it just rarely happens in a midterm that the party in power doesn't lose a lot of seats. In this case, you have this president who is such an outlier, such a big figure, divisive, uh, he has made the left insane. The news news people have abandoned all their principles to get at, get at him. Uh, the talk show hosts are all against him. Well, Stephen Colbert had Nancy Pelosi on last night, and it was like, oh, please, I hope we win so much. Why is that okay? Why is that okay for a, a public network to broadcast an entertainment show that every night is just essentially a public service announcement for the Democrats. I do not know why that's fair or right. You know, they have the right. I'm not saying they don't have the right to do it. I'm just saying I don't know why that's okay, why that's fair. All right, so that's one thing that would be great. The next thing, of course, is that we hold the Senate but lose the House. That's the one that everybody's been saying has happened. That is kind of the common wisdom, what everybody says is going to take place next. That, too, if we don't get like wiped out in the House, that too is a kind of victory because that's just following the map. That means that Donald Trump and the resistance have not had a big effect. That, that just means that Donald Trump and the resistance haven't had a huge effect. You know, it means that for all the hysteria, for all the, you know, news skewing its, its stories, for all the entertainment industry coming out against it, not much has happened. That's just the map. That's the way it goes. The other is the blue wave. That was what was supposed to happen. But right now, according to the polls, which, like I say, are all over the place and nobody knows, if the blue wave happens, then we have to recalibrate. We have to say this is going to be a terrible two years in which Donald Trump, who is a, a master politician, he's going to be playing the opposition, but it's not going to be pretty. Not a lot is going to get done. And, you know, a lot has gotten done. You know, Congress with a small majority has really accomplished a lot. They passed the tax reform bill. That was a big deal. They've rolled back regulations. They use that Congressional Review Act. Uh, and of course, the great judges, there have been 84 great judges. The economy, I mean, nobody, you know, this is the funny thing. Elections nowadays are about nothing. They're about ginning up your emotions, both sides. And I, you know, this is true on both sides. They're about what will make you emotional, what will get you out to the polls. In a sane world, if this were a sane, you know, if this were the world from the civics class where they say, this is democracy, this is how democracy works. In a sane world, we would be talking about the incredible economy. You know, do you want to keep this economy? This is These are the guys who brought you the economy. Put them back in. They will bring you more of the economy. Workers' pay, which everybody's been complaining about, has ratcheted up. It's reached the highest level in over nine years. Uh, the new job numbers came out. They were unbelievable. The unemployment rate is still at 3.7, which is the lowest rate since 1969. No major industry in the nation lost jobs as the increase in hiring just continues to surge. It is absolutely unbelievable. This economy is absolutely unbelievable, and it is because of the regulations dialing back. And, you know, here is an, uh, this, just another interesting thing. The press, which has become radicalized, like I said, 8% of the people, the radical 8% of the country is running like 80% of the press. And that is 
a sin and it's wrong. And it, it, you know, it's not that they don't have the right. They have the First Amendment. They have any right they want, but it shouldn't be this way. It should not be this way. And it's skewing everything. So we're paying attention to all the radicals, this socialist Andrew Gillum, who looks to me like a corrupt city mayor in Florida, who seems to be ahead. Uh, Casio Cortez, of course, who is just you know, I mean, if the woman bumped into a wall in a, in a corner, it would take three people and a crane to get her out. She doesn't know anything about anything. She and Don Lemon should have a conversation because it would just be like sort of vapid little speech clouds going back and forth. They don't, neither of them knows a damn thing. This guy, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Roberto, Roberto, he's, a, he's such a Hispanic fellow. Uh, O'Rourke, who's, they're just in love with in Texas. He looks like he's going to get blown away and Ten, it looks like the inner polls are like eight, nine, ten percent uh, for Ted Cruz. But they're in love with all these people. That the fact is, and Kim Strassel points this out in the Wall Street Journal today, the fact is, to fight back against Donald Trump, a lot, a lot of the people running on the left are running as moderates. Now it's a scam, not because they might not be moderates in their hearts, but because they're going to vote with Pelosi or whoever it is who is in charge. They're going to vote with the left on everything, on everything. It doesn't matter whether they're nice people. It doesn't matter whether they served in the military. It doesn't matter what. But there have been a lot. They're putting up a lot of veterans. Uh, Kim Strassel says it's the year of the Democrat veteran. In battleground after battleground districts, Democrats recruited former service members as their candidates. And most of them are running as moderates. I mean, even this uh, Kirsten Cinema in Arizona, who called herself a Prada socialist. She said, I'm a Prada socialist. She was caught on tape saying that she's running as a moderate. And, and so, and oh, and uh, who's the other one? Claire McCaskill in, um, in Missouri. She put out a radio ad, right? saying, oh, I'm, she's not one of those crazy Democrats. That's what the radio ad says. Claire McCaskill, she's not one of those crazy Democrats. So uh, Brett Baer asked her about this, and she said, well, I mean, I'm being civil. And then Brett Baer and she had this wonderful exchange, cut number uh, uh, 10. Well, just to be clear, there's not another crazy Democrat in the Senate. Well, I would say this. I would not call my colleagues crazy, but Elizabeth Warren sure went after me when I advocated tooling back some of the regulations for small banks and and credit unions. Um, I certainly disagree with Bernie Sanders on a bunch of stuff. I'm not calling my colleagues crazy, but uh, Elizabeth uh, Warren and Bernie Sanders are just a little bit, you know what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the way they're, they're running. They are running to the right. For all the, the, the press on Ocasio-Cortez and Andrew Gillum, they are running to the right as moderates, which they're not and will not be. And if they take the House, we're going to hear about impeachment almost immediately. Believe me, everything, everything they say is going to go by the boards. Let us talk about Ring, because Ring is a way to keep neighborhoods safe. That is their mission, and they start with your house. Over a million people are using the amazing Ring video doorbell to help protect their home. Ring knows that home security begins at the front door, but it doesn't end there. So now they're extending the same level of security to the rest of your home with the Ring floodlight cam. Just like Ring's amazing doorbell, floodlight cam is a motion-activated camera and floodlight that connects right to your phone with HD video video and two-way audio that lets you know the minute anyone steps on your property. This is no matter where you are, you got it on your phone. I love this thing because it makes you it makes you feel safe, but it also actually gives you safety because you can see and speak to visitors and even set off an alarm right from your phone. You can save up to 150 bucks off a Ring of Security kit when you go to ring.com slash Clavin. Ring.com slash Clavin. That's ring.com slash Clavin. You can put a Ring of Security around your home with spotlights that go off automatically, with communication, you can get right on your phone and say, hey, how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Go to ring.com slash Clavin for 150 bucks off. So meanwhile, we've got Donald Trump. And of course, Donald, the, the Democrats are trying to push the whole thing toward health care, which is a good issue. It's a good issue because of John McCain, because John McCain caused the Republicans to fail to repeal Obamacare, and then they would have had to reform it and fix it. Instead, they've got this kind of limping Frankenstein monster. It just won't die, and it's a, a mess, and it's going to be a mess, and people are concerned about it, rightly concerned. Uh, you know, Obama screwed up everything. He screwed up the Middle East, and he screwed up our health care system, uh, made it much worse than it was, and so they're pushing. Of course, what they're pushing is universal health care, which is even a worse mess, but still, that's their issue, and Trump is trying to keep it on the caravan. This caravan which I don't know who's paying for it, 
But this caravan has clearly been a blessing for Trump, and he has played it. He's now sending, I think, approximately 500,000 troops. No, I'm joking. I, the last I heard it was like 15,000 troops or something. By the time he's finished, the entire American military will be standing on the Mexican border. And he says they're going to play it tough. You know, there is intel coming in that the people, that he is right about the people in this caravan, that many of them armed, some of them are dangerous, some of them present uh, security threats to the United States. And he's got the, they threw rocks at the Mexican police, and Trump says that is not going to happen here. This is cut number four. Because they're throwing rocks viciously and violently. You saw that three days ago, really hurting the military. We're not going to put up with that. They want to throw rocks at our military. Our military fights back. We're going to consider, and I told them, consider it a rifle. When they throw rocks like they did at the Mexico military and police, I say, consider it a rifle. You know, and that's tough talk, but he's right. You know, you cannot have your military being, you know, rocks can kill, rocks can really hurt people. But he's talking about real, that's a really dangerous situation. People can get hurt that way. And they asked uh, Jim Mattis, you know, they're saying, you know, they're, they're talking about this, that Trump is doing this for the election. That's true. This is a good issue for him. It's a good issue for the Republicans. The Democrats do not know what to say because they're secretly for open borders. They like, what did Rush call them? Undocumented Democrats. They like undocumented Democrats coming into the country. So he's right. They're right about this. But, but you cannot pretend that Trump has not been banging this drum since the last election, since 2016. He has been. This is an issue for him. So he's using it now with the caravan coming. But they're just pretending it's not there, and it is there, so it is a real issue. And they asked Jim Mattis, they say, well, this is just a campaign stunt sending uh, troops to the border. Not a good question to ask Mattis. Here's his response. Yeah, the support that we provide to the Secretary uh, for uh, Homeland Security uh, is practical uh, support based on the request from the Commissioner of uh, Customs and Border Police and so uh, we don't we don't do stunts in this department. Thank you. <laughs> we don't do stunts, and you got you got to believe him because otherwise he'll kill you. You know, I mean, like, he just reaches out and rips your throat out. You know, are you sure this is not a stunt? I kill you. You know, Mattis is tough, but, but this, the thing is, the thing is, the Democrats have lost their way on this. They have just gone. We've played every possible person we can, you know, like that saying that there shouldn't be uh, Democrats, Harry Reid saying there shouldn't be birthright citizenship and all the Democrats saying, you know, from Barack Obama on down saying that we can't just let have open borders and let people in, but they've all changed. And Project Veritas, which has been going after some of these campaigns in a wicked, wicked way, by which I mean wickedly well, uh, you know, it has got Beto O'Rourke's people just saying, oh, yeah, we're using campaign funds to uh, feed the, ca the caravan, to help people through. We're sending trucks down there. And he caught them on this. Uh, let's let's hear a little bit of that, an excerpt of that. I just hope nobody that's the wrong person finds out For me, I can ignore the rules and I'll f I don't mind breaking the rules and I can defend any position. Yeah, I was going to use the vans, too. So we might, we could probably use that. I could be using the vans. Yeah. Yeah, we're I'm thinking of like we're gonna use that to give some of those immigrants rides to like the airport to the bus station. Why not? You know? Yeah. I'm done being nice. I'm done being professional. You know, because <laughs> nothing is professional. None of this is like shit that there's a rule. Yeah, for, like you know. Don't ever repeat this one's wrap up. Like mm -hmm. if we just say we're buying food for some event, like the Halloween events, because there's block walks coming up for Halloween. Have you been able to go and like um, help out anymore with the other people? Mm -hmm. I did yesterday. Um, t tonight we get more, so it's I don't know how that's gonna go. Tonight you get more. There's more people coming. More people coming? Oh wow. You know, and uh, this is this is a fair video because this is a tone that is coming down from the top. Uh, first, the, in terms of immigration, but also in terms of dishonesty. O'Rourke has been lying about the fact that he was in a hit-and-run accident and left the scene of the crime. He was he, He's uh, buried a, an incident that happened in Texas a long time ago. I'll try and get back to that. Uh, so th this dishonesty, this kind of thing, like there are no rules. We'll say anything. We'll do anything as long as we can do what we want. That's typical leftism. It's the typical way these guys behave. So that's what we've got. We've got Trump on the one side. I'm sending the military. Mattis is going down there personally and will be personally biting the heads off illegal immigrants. That's Trump. And on the other side is, yeah, we're stealing campaign funds to help them. And we don't really care about the people who sent us the money and we'll do it whatever we want. There's no rule book here. So 
Trump has an ad you, taking advantage of this moment. Trump now has a new ad, very powerful ad. And for those of you who are not watching but are listening, it features this monster, uh, you know, hardly, couldn't hardly call him a human being, this Louis uh, Bracamontas, who is now on death row after he murdered two California sheriff's deputies. And you will see in this, it's a little hard to hear, but they have, they have uh, subtitles. But you'll see, as when he was in court, he was laughing and saying, I wish I could have killed more police. And this is featured in the new Trump ad. Here it is. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please step out of the hallway. He says he wants to apply for pardon for the felony he committed. Attempt of murder. Who else, it says, who else will the Democrats let in? The Democrats let him in, and President Trump is making America safe again. Uh, you know, let, let's talk about this ad for a couple minutes here. Uh, you know, Bracamontes came in, snuck in, I think, during the Bill Clinton era. He committed crimes. He, was, he went back. He was sent back and deported. He broke in again. He broke in, I think, twice more. Uh, he came in under the Bush administration. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit dishonest to say Democrats let him in. Who else will they let in? But, you know, philosophically, it's not as dishonest as all that. It is, there is one side that wants the borders secured. There was one side that wants the border secured, and then you got another side. You got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez saying, you know, I just want the ice to be there to ensure safe passage, safe passage. You know, one side, you know, I'm, I'm reading this book about the way our moral senses are developed, and uh, this is by Jonathan Haidt, The uh, Righteous Mind, and he talks about the different levels of, the different ways we react morally to things. And one of them is whether we care about somebody and whether we do harm to somebody. But then there are other ways. And he says that liberals only react on this care, harm matrix, where, uh, uh, axis, whereas Republicans and conservatives re react on many different axes on our mor morality. So they're going, oh, I care. These people, I, you know, and, and we say, well, wait, yeah, but there are a whole other things. The rule of law matters. Uh, the borders matter. Lots of different things matter. So it is fair to say, it is fair to say illegal aliens have caused a lot of crime. I've visited prisons, a lot of illegal aliens in our prisons. And it's, it, we have to have some kind of security at the border. It is fair to say that this is an emotional ad but of course, of course, of course, the left has to call it racist. Why is it racist? It is racist. It shows pictures of people trying to break through, trying to break through the border fences, breaking through border fences. Why is it racist? Because the people in the ad are Mexicans, right? The people in the ad are Mexicans. They're not hanging out on the Canadian border watching, you know, boring old Canadians come over the border like that. First of all, they're not doing it. They're Canadians, so they always apply and go through all the rules and regulations and all this. It is true that a lot of illegals come in by overstaying their visas. That is true, and that's a problem as well. But this is a very, very dramatic problem that is affecting people in the border states. It's not affecting East Coast liberals in New York and L.A. Well, it is affecting them in L.A. But if you're rich enough, it's not bother they're not coming into your neighborhood. They're not uh, bothering you. You're getting the hardworking people who want to do things, you know, take on the jobs, as they say, that Americans won't take on. You know, this, this is a serious problem, and he is absolutely right. And they're comparing it to the Willie Horton ad in 19... 88, this was when Dukakis was running, and, um, and Bush ran this ad saying that, uh, that this murderer, Willie Horton, had gone off on a furlough program that Dukakis approved of and struck again. Here's that ad. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. 
One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. That's a very powerful ad. Willie Horton was black. You wouldn't know if you weren't looking at it, but he happened to be black. I'm going to talk about this in just a second. But first, I want to tell you that coming up on Tuesday, November 6th, Election Day, our next episode of Daily Wire Backstage, the election edition. The God cake, Jeremy Boring, will be lowered from the uh, ceiling as if he were flying. I will be there. The execrable <laughs> Michael Knowles and Elisha Krauss and the lovely Elisha. See, who wrote this copy? It makes it sound like Elisha is also execrable. Nobody would ever say that. She will also be there covering all the latest election news as it happens. And our own Cassie Dillon and Colton Haas will be bringing us updates from Twitter. So make sure to tune in. Is Ben not going to be there? Ben will be there, too. All right. They left out Ben. Oh, because he uh, maybe it was his copy. As always, only Daily Wire subscribers get to ask the question. So make sure to subscribe today. I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook, YouTube. Come to dailywire.com. You know, today, the new episode of Another Kingdom is available for everybody. But if you want to get the full uh, episode on Monday with all the visual bells and whistles that look so good, you got to subscribe. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month. For 100 bucks. you get the entire year plus the leftist tears tum tumbler, with God, which, God willing, we will need on Tuesday. And uh, you get so much. You get the, all our shows. You get all our mailbags. Subscribe. You know, the, and the main reason is we want your money. You have it. We want it. That is the main reason to subscribe. Come over to dailywire.com. All right. You know, let's, so let's talk about this, Willie Horton. And, and let's talk about the, the new ad. Is this racist? Is it racist? Now, when the Dukakis ad came out, I was a liberal. I voted for Dukakis. And I saw that ad, and they started screaming immediately, oh, 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 the racist. And I thought, what's racist about it? What's racist about it? Oh, I get it. It's racist because the killer happens to be black. So there are two ways to look at the world, right? One of them is through the lens of race, and the other is not through the lens of race. The argument of the left. So if you're not looking through the lens of race, you're only looking at behavior. A man came in and killed two sheriff's deputies uh, who had been here illegally before, and he slipped in again. We need border security. I don't care what color he is. And to, to be honest with you, I don't care what color he is. I do not care what color he is or what color the sheriff's deputies were. The sheriff's deputies, as far as I'm concerned, were colored khaki. They're on my side. They're the good guys. This guy's the bad guy. That's the way I look at it. I'm not saying I'm colorblind. I'm not saying I'm free of all the uh, little glitches that human beings have in their heads. I'm not but I overcome them. I'm a free human being with a logical mind who can overcome some of those prejudices. And I would say most of those prejudices, I'm just not looking at that. I'm looking, if you let a murderer go free, you're not, you have not got the right criminal policy. I thought that then when I was a liberal, I think it now that I'm a conservative, I still think it. And I do not think their charge is, is valid. I think that you, you are not allowed to say you cannot criticize this person. If you criticize this person according to the, and he's a certain color, you are against that color skin. We know you can't do it because they immediately turn around. If a, a dark person uh, disagrees with them, they immediately jump on him. So it's not about that. It's all about the leftism. As I said yesterday, it's not about the color of the skin. That's a scam. But what about Trump himself? Is Trump a, a racist? I mean, I think you know, I watched Trump and I have been, he, he said one thing to me that was egregious, which was when he was running the first time and they asked him if he would disavow the Ku Klux Klan and he stumbled on it. He stumbled on it. He didn't do it. He waited a day. I don't know how long it was, maybe two days before he stumbled on it. Now, I interpreted that, I interpret that as really bad politicking. Trump wants to win. You know, that's his thing. He wants to win. And sometimes he overlooks the moral aspect of something. You disavow the Ku Klux Klan, even if it costs your votes, you do it. It's just something you do. You have to. You know, if you can't disavow the Klan, what do you stand for? You don't stand for anything. He hesitated because he wanted those votes. No one could possibly believe that this guy is a Klansman. That's an absurd argument. You know, the other day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something almost nice about Hillary Clinton. The other day, this piece of, of video of Hillary Clinton made the rounds. Uh, this is Hillary making a joke during an interview. Let's play it. 
accomplished. What do you think of Cory Booker's, and you didn't comment on him, and you're, feel free to... Oh, I, I adore no, him. What do you think about him saying, kick them in the shins, essentially, start to get to that kind of political... Well, that was Eric Holder. Yeah, Eric Holder. Oh, Eric Holder, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know they all look alike. No, they don't. <laughs> Oh, well done. All right, so everyone on the right jumped on Hillary Clinton, and listen, listen, kicking Hillary Clinton around is good sport, and we should all do it. It's lots of fun. But I've made that joke. A lot of people I know have made that joke. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's funny, first of all, and, and it, it's based in some kind of small truth. You know, it's a little harder uh, for white people to distinguish people of color from one another. Sometimes, you know, I remember when I pitched the movie One Missed Call. It was a Japanese horror film, and I had to go in and pitch my version of it. I got the plot all wrong because I confused. It was a Japanese. I confused two of the beautiful uh, Japanese actresses in the film, and I mistook the plot. And they, they, people I was pitching it to had to correct me. You know, so it's funny. If we can't laugh with each other about this, we can't live together. If we can't make jokes jokes about each other, we can't live together. That is the way you discharge hostility in a uh, non-toxic way. There's nothing wrong with what Hillary Clinton said. I know we're supposed to jump on her in every little thing, and I know they would jump on us if it, if it were the other way around. I mean, good golly, if it had been Trump who made that joke, you know, they'd be outside with pitchforks. Still, still, I think that you either look at the world and say, hey, I know we're all different colors. I know there's some, you know, glitches in there in our minds that make there's some tribalism inside. We were born to be tribal. It's a good evolutionary adaptation. I know all that stuff, but so what? We're going to make jokes about it. We're going to be fine. We're all going to get together. We're all Americans. That's one way of looking at the world. That is one way of looking at the world. I seriously believe that that is the way Trump thinks. I, you know, you know, I'm not uh, uh, averse to dumping on Trump or attacking Trump when I think he's wrong, when I think he's doing something wrong. I seriously think he's just thinking about fixing stuff and, and, and winning and winning. Sometimes he thinks about winning so much he forgets to think about things that are a little bit more important than winning, but that's what he's thinking about. When Jim Acosta said to him, you call yourself a nationalist, um, aren't you worried that people like me will uh, try and twist that as I will to say white nationalist? Trump's response was, I've never even heard that theory. I've never even heard about that before. I literally think that's true. I literally think he does not. When, when he was talking in Charlottesville, and, and I know Ben and I disagree about this, and he said there are great people on both sides. If you go back and listen to that transcript, and Tr Trump is not always the clearest speaker in the world, he's clearly referring to both sides of the question of whether statues like the, that of Robert E. Lee should be torn down. That's what he's talking about. The media made it sound as if he was saying, oh, there's great people on the Nazi party. That, uh, you know, which is absurd. Does anybody really think that, you know, Trump goes to Ivanka and says, well, yes, you, you're Jewish, but there are great people in the Nazi party too. No, I mean, no, it doesn't make any sense. People, it's like when people say Trump is Hitler and you say, yeah, is he killing anybody? Is he rounding anybody up? What's he doing? That's, you know, people live in their imaginations and they do not make the distinction between their imaginations and reality. We all do this a little bit. The left does it all the time. I seriously believe that Trump is just not thinking in those terms. Remember, remember, the left set the terms of racism. The left set the terms about whether we should discuss every little thing about racism. Is it racist if you're in an elevator and a black man gets in to be nervous about that? Is that racist? You know, I don't actually think it is if you're in a, if you're in a neighborhood where black people commit crimes. But so what if it is? So what? It's a little glitch in your mind. So what? It's not hostile. It doesn't mean you're going to be mean or not hire people or anything like that. The left set the terms where we're supposed to walk on glass about everything we say, about every move we make, anything that comes into your mind that may not be the, you know, that is part of original sin and part about the broken life of being a human being. They set these terms. They set these terms. You know, somebody said to me, one of my favorite things that somebody once said about me was, you don't even know you're offensive. You don't even know you're offensive. And that's true because I really know in my heart that I only want people to do what they want and be happy. That's my point of view. If I say something that's offensive, hey, I'm a person of goodwill. You know, it, it's probably just a glitch, something I stumbled over. They left set these terms and they only apply to the right. They only apply to the right. Remember, when Harry Reid or whoever, Joe Biden says, oh, Barack Obama, he's what a clean Negro. We don't have that many clean Negroes. That's fine. They don't care about that. If anybody on the right says it, it's a problem. You know, I want to take a look. And by the way, just to throw this in, uh, President Trump uh, used his executive power for the first time to designate a national monument establishing a 380-acre site in Kentucky to honor African-Americans' role as soldiers during the Civil War. 
Uh, so that he's the worst white supremacist ever. There's just no question about it. They set the terms in which gaffes are revealing, and most of the time, they're lying. So Mitt Romney says, I'm going to stuff women in binders. Or, oh, we had all these women in binders, meaning we had resumes of women. We were looking to hire women, and we had women in our binders. And they said, oh, what a gaff! What a gaff!" You know, Mitt Romney, the man who stuffs women into binders. Help, Mitt, don't do it. Yes, I must stuff you into the binders so you don't escape. You know, it's like the woman you keep in a pumpkin shell. I stuff them into binders. Nonsense. It's nonsense, and it only runs one way. So let's take a look at some of the gaffes that maybe are a little bit more revealing than that Hillary Clinton one. I let Hillary Clinton off the hook because I know she was not saying anything racist. She was making a joke. It's okay for us to make jokes. Not everything we say has to be judged on a scale of okay or outrage. That's ridiculous. We're just human beings. We're all Americans. We're living together. But let's take a look at some real gaffes that really were interesting. Uh, Joe Donnelly in Indiana was debating. Debating. Senator Joe Donnelly in Indiana is debating. Uh, he has a slim lead right now over the Republican challenger, Mike Braun. And he made this remark about how his staff <laughs> is diverse. We want everybody to have a chance in Indiana and in America. And my offices reflect that, both on the campaign side and on the Senate side. Our state director is Indian American, but he does an amazing job. Our director of all constituent services, she's African American. But she does an even more incredible job than you could ever imagine. It isn't their race or their religion. It's the incredible person that they are. But at the same time, they have to have a chance. Now, <laughs> I, I don't usually cringe, but I have to say, when I heard that, I, I did cringe. He's African-American, but she does an amazing job. But that's a gaffe. And does it reveal that secretly in his heart he's a racist? You know, I don't think so. I have to say, to his credit, his, his challenger, Mike Braun, said, I don't hold out against him. I don't think he's a racist. What an adult thing to say. But he added, he added that if it had been me, if it had been a Republican, it is all we would be hearing in the news. And that's the difference. So, you know, there are gaffes and there are gaffes. The difference is the gaff meter only goes one way. It only ratchets one way. Then there are things that are actually are kind of revelatory. All right. Elizabeth Warren, and obviously in Massachusetts, she's debating. And she was going back and forth with Jeff Deal. And they were discussing the Kavanaugh hearings, which is, a, you know, a big issue that really did turn the tide, I think, of the way voters were feeling. People thought, if, if you guys are going to do that, and if the press is going to do that to a, a man without any corroboration, without any proof, you guys are out of control. And I think that really did give some momentum to the right. So Warren's thing is, well, you didn't stand up for Christine Blasey Ford. And Deal's thing is, you know, you didn't stand up for due process. In the middle of this, he mentions the fact that she sent out a fundraising letter, which I believe is against the Senate rules, based on the Kavanaugh hearing. And he says, you know, you did that, and it slips through the cracks until the moderator brings it up again and listen to what Elizabeth Warren does. That was such an intense moment in our country's history as far as trying to deal with presumption of innocence, the cornerstone of our legal system. And you were willing to throw it right out the window because you were part of the Senate Democrats who were trying to score political points by using poor Dr. Ford's testimony as a way to drag down a man without any corroborating evidence. So, so, so I don't think I quite understand the answer uh, because I'm looking for the times when you've called out Donald Trump when he's made fun of someone like Dr. Ford, when he's I, made fun of someone who's I, disabled. I, I, would, I would like to drill down on what Representative Deal said. Uh, the, the fundraising while the vote was being taken on the Kavanaugh hearing, did you or did you not do that? I, actually, I don't know, and I don't know what the... I'll there has been an Isn't ethics. there an ethics committee? In, in, yes, there's there an ethics complaint? complaint has been filed about a fundraising Then, then I, will, I will check into it, but I don't know. Do you have any response to that? I don't. Representative? You could hear the audience groaning uh, distantly in the background because she lied. I mean, she lied, and she lied with a kind of 
uh, reflex that I've seen before. Obama used to lie like that. I don't know. I don't know what we're fundraising. <laughs> How do I know what we're fundraising? I mean, that's absurd, utterly absurd. And that is telling. That's really telling. There's an ethics uh, complaint filed against her, and she hadn't heard about it. She looked completely blindsided uh, by that. And, you know, we can make fun of the Pocahontas stuff, but that's another way that she's been lying. You know, I mean, it would have been so simple, so simple for her to say, you know, gee, that was a family legend, and I believed it, and now I know it's not true, but instead she said, no, look, I'm one one thousandth and twenty-fourth of an Indian, so uh, get me a headdress and off I go. You know, I mean, I think that, that that does tell something about her. And then there is some really bad stuff coming up. And again, I'm talking about this stuff because the press doesn't. If the press did, we would be having a much different election. It would not be about these kind of big uh, roundhouse punches that everybody's throwing, but it would be, in fact, about the nature of these people. Andrew Gillum, who... The polls show him winning in uh, against Ron DeSantis in Florida for governor, which I just think is amazing. I mean, what is going on that they think this uh, corrupt mayor, socialist mayor, is a good guy? And they, and once again, Project Veritas went in and talked to one of his campaign staffers, Omar Smith, who also said he was a friend of his and an old pal of his. And just he just Omar Smith, who has since been fired since this video, said, "Yeah, we just lie about all our positions because we don't want." people to know the truth. Fairy tales in the modern day begin with once I am elected. I, I don't see, just can't say, but I do think he's not saying specifically like I'm going to ban bump stocks, I'm going to come against ARs only because he's running a race right now. I do think he would support anybody to do that stuff. Bill Nelson. Right, that's all I'm worried about. Yeah. Whatever, whoever the next person may be. I just wish he's trying to get the moderates and the gun toting people in my Florida. All right, this is a bad state. Okay. It's a cracker state. Okay. Okay, ask anybody outside of here. You go Port St. Lucie, Orlando. Man, them crackers ain't gonna let us do that. No, you crazy. So, what is he doing? He's campaigning, he's politicking. So you're saying that different environments, wherever he speaks, he'll, he'll address a different audience. Yeah, that's what a politician do. So just, we, we lie, it's a cracker state, it's a effed up state, you know, it's a, and they fired him, but still, you know, it, I think that tells you something. You know, it's like, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a woman comes up to you in a bar or, or a man comes up to a woman in a bar and tries to pick you up and you say, you know, that's really flattering, but I'm married. And she says, oh, well, your wife doesn't have to find out. It's like, I know my wife doesn't have to find out. That's not the point. So when you got your campaign workers who are saying, yeah, we lie because it's a cracker state. We hate them. We hate them. Why are you running? If you hate the state, if you hate the people, why are you running? You know, to impose on them something against their will? Is that why you're running? Is that what your politics is about? You know, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And it, is, it is a real deal. These, these are real scandals, not just gaffes. The New York Times released an expose. I was talking about this before. I started talking about this, about Beto O'Rourke when he was in real estate development. Uh, first of all, it revealed for the first time that he's not a blue collar guy, but the son-in-law of a billionaire. Uh, and they reported that O'Rourke's father-in-law proposed gentrifying a neighborhood in El Paso by force, bulldozing public housing to make way for restaurants, a shopping district, and an art walk. And O'Rourke, the Times claimed, served, served as the, quote, pretty face for the plan while also serving in city government. What's interesting about this story, when it came out, they were attacked, the Times was attacked, savaged by its readers who didn't want to hear about this. This is a, a problem that the Times has created for itself by becoming a leftist rag instead of what it used to be, a newspaper. It now has readers who will o only want to hear the good news about the left. They don't, don't want to hear these stories, so you can't report the truth without losing your audience, which is fine if you're Sean Hannity or, uh, you know, uh, Chris, what's his name on MSNBC, if you're an open uh, partisan. But if you're supposed to be a newspaper and you can't report the news, you've really screwed things up. All right, so look, listen, here we are. We do not know what's going to happen. We just don't know. I really do believe that things could go either way. I am hopeful. I am hopeful that there is going to be a hold in the House. I think there is the, how can I say it? The, the situation is there, exists, that could uh, create that. I think if the press were reporting simply honestly, simply uh, po in a po-faced, straightforward way, it would be that way. But I think uh, we're just going to have to find out. It is a tense, interesting, suspenseful race. It is uh, an amazing race. And I think like it's, it's really worth following. So 
into the Clavenless weekend we go. It is a shorter weekend because we, we had a lo- longer one last time and it did not work out very well. Murders, craziness, it was terrible. We hope this one will be easier and stave it off with another kingdom. The new episode is out today for everybody. Please listen to it. Support your local Michael Knowles. He's the performer. It's a great, it really is a good story. This one is really terrific. It's an excellent story. I think we're getting something like 100,000 listeners an episode. Please listen to it. Please go on iTunes and leave a good review for it. Subscribe. If you you are not going to subscribe to dailywire.com, at least subscribe to it on uh, iTunes. It really helps us out. But, but you should subscribe to dailywire.com. We give you so much stuff. Your ten bucks will just will your ten bucks will laugh. It will it will laugh as it leaves your hand because you'll be getting so much stuff in return. I will be back on Monday. Those of you who survived the Clavenless weekend also come back on Monday, and we will charge into the election week. It's going to be an interesting one. I'm Andrew Claven. This is the Andrew Claven Show. <laughs> The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And our animations are by Cynthia Angulo and Jacob Jackson. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire forward publishing production. Copyright forward publishing 2018.